We had a very ambitious program uh, planned for our centenarians. We had uh, some information about uh, centenarians' uh, health condition from other studies, but very little information about psychosocial functioning. And so we decided to, um, uh, to ask many questions, but in order to do so, our centenarians would have to be uh, cognitively functioning so that they could engage in our conversation and that they could uh, endure the rigor of our testing that we wanted. Now, Ms. Larmore, I'm going to ask you some questions to check your memory and concentration. I'm going to name three objects, and I want you to repeat them after me, and then I'm going to ask you to remember them. Apple, table, penny. Apple, table, penny. Now, I would like for you to spell the word world. W-O-R-L-D. Can you spell it backwards? D-L-O. Uh, I left out an R. <laughs> then O and W. <laughs> now I'd like for you to read this and do what it says. Close your eyes. Thank you. You can open them now. <laughs> It's often uh, forgotten that we have uh, two other age groups that are also involved in the Georgia Centenarian study. A group of people in their 80s, who we called uh, master survivors, on their way to become very, very old. And then we looked at people in their 60s as well to look at uh, sort of a control or comparison group. Because at that time, when we started in the 1980s, there was a lot of knowledge about people aging in their 60s and maybe early 70s. But there was very little knowledge about people aging in the 80s, 90s, and beyond. And so we thought the uh, first uh, step for us to take would be a cross-sectional study to compare different age groups, people at different ages, uh, very old age, 100, 80, and 60. Can you share some of the thinking in selecting the control groups, 60s and 80s? And, and why do we choose 20 years as a time? Well, for one thing, we did not want to have adjacent cohorts. Um, so we did not want to compare centenarians to nonagenarians, because it would be difficult to argue that a 101-year-old would be different from a 99-year-old. So we wanted to have enough of a spread between these age groups so that we could really conclude there is a difference and that the difference would be it is easily noticeable because of the 20-year the um, differences in, uh, in time. The same approach was used basically in the uh, Bond Longitudinal Study, and they were able to point out that uh, some of the um, differences really were cohort differences because of the way that their cohorts was, were placed in time. Uh, we see uh, tremendous declines in functional health among centenarians. Uh, the ability to uh, take care of certain household tasks or even just the ability to walk. So if I see a cross-sectional difference of somebody who is 100 comparing to somebody who is 80 or 60, then there is certainly a possibility that that difference is also due to some aging decline. So what you are left with is basically alternative explanations that you have when you look at centenarians and compare them to younger age groups where you can say, well, maybe it is because something does decline from 80 to 100, it is a possibility. But you also have to allow for um, generational or cohort differences, that the differences are more explained by what these people have experienced in their lives. Mr. Miller, now I would like for you to copy this picture onto this piece of paper here. And then there are some aspects uh, of development which are likely to decline, uh, and if they do decline, you should see them in cross-sectional studies. So, for example, who do you compare these centenarians with? <laughs> That's not very good. <laughs> now, I have some pictures that I would like for you to look at, and each picture I would like for you to name what each object is. If it's only one group, it's hard to say whether they are really different from other groups. So it is a very efficient first cut 
that you make in looking at uh, uh, different age groups and comparing one group that has made it to a group that in all likelihood will not make it to 100. Toothbrush. Why do we choose studying 80 to 90 centenarians? Do we have any statistical evidence to show the number that we have is sufficient? For many of the analysis that we do, 80 or 90 centenarians may be enough. And uh, your statistical finding will not get any better or any worse if you have 150 or 300 or 500 or 800 centenarians. So you, may, you may, may need to be a little bit more humble in the kinds of analysis you can do, but there are plenty of analysis that you can do with a sample size of 80 or 90. So our first centenarians that we studied were born uh, around 1888. So they were um, young adults during World War One.